In the summer of 2006, after several internships, I was finally ready for my first full-time journalism job. Because my boyfriend refused to move away from Southern California, my options for starting my career were limited. After multiple interviews across the region, I was a candidate at two papers. One was the Los Angeles' Daily News' Palmdale Division, which during the course of my 90-minute interview, I heard the police scanner call out three 187s. Any old school rap fan knows what that code means. The other was for the Santa Clarita Signal, a local paper located in the Santa Clarita Valley, an area very similar to my hometown of Thousand Oaks, a former Western enclave that became a sleeper community for those who worked in Los Angeles but wanted to live around other conservative Christian white people. I mean, were, wanted their kids to go to good schools. <laughs> the man who interviewed me at the Signal was Ryan. He stood about six foot two, jet black eyes, thin mustache, and a nose that looked like it smelled something foul. He was the news editor, and I was one of four reporters that he hired at the same time, with my beat focusing on L.A. County and water. Two months in, and I was flying high. I had gotten the rhythm of my beat, and I was living the dream I had craved so long. I was a writer. The radio was playing Suddenly I See by Katie Tunstall. (laughs) Yes. And I was singing along happily while driving down the old road in my Toyota Camry from one of my interviews. I pulled into the parking lot of the signal off of Auto Center Drive, a swing in my step as I headed towards my desk. However, shortly after I sat down, Brian called me into our small office in the newsroom and shut the door. His foul-smelling nose sniffed at me, and his voice became low and menacing. Given that this once happened to me in journalism school with a professor, I should have known from the moment the door closed. From that day on, scheduled alongside my 11 articles a week, Brian would tell me several days in the room that I was the worst writer he had ever seen, how everyone thought I was terrible, and if it was only because of him, I wasn't fired. My, ju- my heart dropped, and by the time I left work, I was in tears, crying in my Camry as I made my way back to my parents' house in Thousand Oaks. It didn't make sense. I had been writing consistently since I was 13. Everything in my life indicated I was good at it. I had achieved so much in my college journalism career. Hell, what, when that professor pulled me into his office... He ate his words two months later when I became state recognized for my writing skills. As my natural tendency of people telling me I can't do something is to give the middle finger and do it anyway. (laughs) Yet no matter who did or didn't believe in my writing while I was at university, I was now in the real world not good enough for a local paper. If I wasn't good, why did no one tell me? The only thing that made these days easy were the new staff I worked with. The writers had lunches and after work hangouts, with Brian trying to act like everybody's friend. Yet behind closed doors, he continued to be awful. I got negative points on my performance review on everything, and Brian reiterated week in and week out, I would have been fired if not for him. I confided in the photographers about his behavior. They nodded and acknowledged I wasn't the first woman on staff to have this issue, and honestly, I wouldn't be the last. People on the staff started to bond, and I particularly hit it off with one of the education reporters who was hired at the same time as me. One night, I hung out with her after work, drinking wine in her apartment and playing with her cat, Fatso Catso. As we got more and more drunk, she confessed to me that during her performance review, Brian started making comments about her showing too much cleavage, basically slut-shaming her and asking what boys would think. She covered elementary schools. I started chatting up multiple people across different departments, discovering he was torturing almost everyone. And when I say almost everyone, I refer mainly to the women on staff. Although Kim, a copy editor and Brian's on-again, off-again girlfriend, was somehow spared. Around this time, two high-level writers left, one of whom was on the business beat. I asked Brian for it, 
In my internships in college and while on my county beat, I found the subject to be fascinating. After several days, he agreed, although pointedly adding yet again that I wasn't good enough and if it wasn't for him, I'd be fired. Great. When it came to business, there was real estate, movie and television locating for shoot, shooting for shows like Weeds, and of course, Magic Mountain. That's about it. Yet I found my own voice on the desk, meeting with small business owners to tell their stories, finding my favorite sources over time, and building relationships with them. It made me happy to go to work every day, and my happiness showed in my writing. I started getting regular praise from other staff members. Brian was determined, though. After making a slight error, he dragged me in front of the publisher and editor-in-chief to fire me. The editor-in-chief was apathetic. But the publisher decided against it. The meetings in the small office with Brian slowed and eventually stopped. I found joy both in and outside the newsroom as I had gotten engaged to my then boyfriend. One day, my mom was getting under my skin about the wedding, so I retreated into the room that we called the morgue. It's where the back issues are kept. Every, every newsroom has a different name for it. Surprisingly, Brian came to find me and ask me what was wrong. For the first time since I met him during my interview, we talked to each other, not him berating me or trying to be a big man, but really talked to one another. He told me about how his mother used to neglect him, and if she wasn't neglecting him, she was beating him. It was so weird seeing my regular tormentor as a human being. Perhaps what he really wanted was to feel good about himself. In April, the newsroom found out that the second-in-command from corporate in Georgia was coming in. The Signal was one of the only papers they had in California. The publisher was ready to show off various awards and staff. However, what corporate saw was at the time the Santa Clarita Valley had 120,000 people. The Signal circulation? 10,000. They decided to restructure, starting with hiring a managing editor. Brian went to the publisher, and they made a deal. Brian would deflect all questions from corporate, and the publisher would guarantee that sweet managing editor gig. Brian went through his end of the bargain, but within a week, the publisher was forced to resign. A managing editor was hired, a woman no less. Brian knew her. In fact... She was one of his favorite tormentees before she left the signal to go work with our rival, the Los Angeles Daily News. And now, she was his boss. <laughs> Shortly after Brian was suspended, an investigation began with no one explaining what was going on. Secrets don't stay silent in newsrooms for long, though. And it turned out Brian was being investigated for sexual harassment. Three female staff members were called in, one of which was Kim. Kim was not supposed to be on the staff. The company had a policy where anybody with a DUI on their record wasn't supposed to be hired. She had one when she applied, but Brian offered to help her. All she had to do was sleep with him. Kim did it and in turn got the job. Brian wasn't done wreaking havoc though. To try to save himself, he told corporate that one of the photographers was smoking marijuana on site, and the photographer was fired. The remaining begged me to tell corporate what Brian did to me, hoping it would save their friend. My fiancé and I were preparing to move into an apartment in Long Beach together, and I was already looking for work down there. I knew nothing I could do would save the photographer, but I needed to make sure Brian wouldn't come back to hurt someone else. I didn't go to corporate. Rather, I went to the managing editor. I smiled in her office, practically flapping like a bird. When she asked why, I told her how many times Brian said how terrible of a writer I was and threatened my job in that very room I was standing in. It was almost like something clicked in her eyes. Around the time I got my new job offer and put in my two weeks, Brian was officially fired. I left the signal in summer of 2007, but the speed bumps in my road as a writer were still throwing me off. Even though Brian was gone, multiple people in my life, 
from future bosses to my soon-to-be ex-husband, degraded my writing. I wanted to make my living at this, but how could I when apparently Brian was right? I was the worst writer anyone had ever seen. The first week of 2012, I left my ex-husband in the next few months, during the pain and the struggle of finding a new home and a new life for myself, I started really writing again. Not for work, not for anyone, for me. Every day I'd take an hour to clack away at the keys as if working out at a gym. Every paragraph made me realize that by not writing, Brian was winning. Abuse would win. I refused to let it. This was me getting stronger, fighting for my life, and it was worth every letter. Last year, I wrote an article that was published in the Los Angeles Times as LA Affairs. I was shocked as I received praise from not only readers, but the editor responsible for the column. Yet as I picked up copies of that major metropolitan Sunday newspaper and opened it to my story, seeing my byline grace the page once again, my face broke into a wicked grin, and the first thought in my head was, hey, Brian, not bad for the worst writer you ever seen, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Round of applause for Reina Abravaya.